Howdy, howdy all. Welcome to Goose Talks Film. I'm your host, Goose, where we review movies every single week. And today I am reviewing new release film, The Iron Claw. Uh, so this has been out, I think in America came out around Christmas time. I think it was up against uh, the new Aquaman movie. In Australia, we got it almost a month later. And then where I live, we only just got it this week. So um, I'm glad I'm able to see it and cover it on the podcast. Um, so yeah, The Iron Claw uh, is quite a a popular film in terms of review um, from uh, fans and from critics. Uh, it's the story of the Von Erichs, a very popular wrestling family in the state of Texas. And also they got famous enough where they were uh, pretty popular in America in general and in certain places overseas as well. Uh, so this is the official spoiler-free synopsis. The true story of the inseparable Von Erich brothers who made history in the intensely competitive world of professional wrestling in the early 1980s. Yeah, so uh, this movie's got a, a pretty phenomenal cast. Uh, when you look at it, it's got Zac Efron as Kevin Von Erich, Jeremy Allen White as Kerry Von Erich, Harris Dickinson as David Von Erich, uh, Maura Tierney as Doris Von Erich, Holt McElhaney as Fritz Von Erich. Also have a few uh, cameos from wrestlers playing other wrestlers. You have Chavo Guerrero, uh, who was also the... Uh, for, uh, sorry, wrestling consultant. He pretty much uh, sorted out all the wrestling in the movie and he did a phenomenal job, but we'll touch on that later. Uh, you have Ryan Namath, who is actually the brother of former WWE superstar Dolph Ziggler. He plays Gino Hernandez in this. And also uh, MJF from AEW also uh, was meant to have a bigger role, but unfortunately all scenes but one were cut from the final edit so unfortunately we weren't able to see MJF in his acting glory but you do get to see him for a couple of seconds but no uh no lines or any dialogue from him unfortunately so yeah um while we stay in the spoiler free section I'll talk about the film briefly and uh I will yeah see if I recommend it to you guys or not, and then we'll get into the uh, spoiler territory where we'll uh, delve deeply into this. Uh, yeah, so I've been wanting to watch this movie uh, ever since it was announced, and then I actually delved more into the background and the story of the Von Erichs, reading just a lot of different articles, watching a lot of videos, and also watched the episode uh, from Dark Side of the Ring, uh, which is a phenomenal series. If you haven't watched it and you're a wrestling fan, if you're not really a wrestling fan, you're kind of intrigued by it, I do recommend it. It is on SBS here in Australia. I think it's on Vice uh, elsewhere in the world. Uh, be able to search it and you, you'll soon find it. It's quite a big show. Uh, yeah, so I watched the episode on that and it covers really everything. Um, this movie did a good job of uh, telling the story. I mean, it's quite a big story, you know, jam-packed into a two-hour and 12-minute movie. Uh, so if you do go to see this at the cinema, you're looking for at least a two-and-a-half-hour movie with ads and whatnot um but yeah so the like i said the cast is phenomenal uh they did a pretty good job with casting um i guess it's spoiler free but you have jeremy allen white who is a phenomenal actor you know he is amazing at everything that he does uh, a few people uh weren't too happy that he was casted initially as kerry von eric uh the i think he's the second or third eldest of the brothers uh, he was actually meant to be an Olympian, but in 1980, I don't know if a lot of people know, uh, America withdrew from the Olympics because it was held in uh, Moscow, Russia. At that point, it was a Cold War, so he missed out on that, and that's when he joined his brothers as being a professional wrestler. Uh, and Kerry was known to be a very imposing figure. He was probably the the biggest in terms of muscle mass and just how big he really was. And Jimmy Allen White, don't get me wrong, he put in a lot of work, and he's quite fit and shredded in this. Uh, in terms of his acting, I think he nailed the acting and everything like that. So does Zac Efron. Uh, Zac Efron clearly worked incredibly hard to not only just get physical, like it's not like a role like Baywatch where he just got massively huge and juiced up to look good and, you know, look sexy for all the women and whatnot out there. He actually had to make his body look like Kevin Von Erichs, and that's quite hard to try and get your body to look like someone else's in terms of building the right muscle in the right places and et cetera, et cetera. So he did, he, he's, in terms of body, he looked very similar to Kevin, very, very similar. Uh, Harris Dickinson is probably the one that looks most like 
uh, the person he was playing, which uh, he plays David Von Erich, and he really does look like him. He's got the height. He's got the right body frame that David had as well. I think the only difference is maybe David did look a little bit more mature and older than what he actually was in terms of his um, facial features and whatnot. But, yeah, incredible casting overall. I think um, the casting of Mikey was really good as well. Uh, the acting in this is just phenomenal. If you're looking for a great movie that tells a very, very sad and depressing movie, uh, if you are willing to go see this, I will uh, do a disclaimer. And also, if you're going to listen to me uh, in the spoiler territory without seeing the movie, uh, this, this really does delve uh, into uh, mental health and suicide as well. So if you are triggered by that or if um, you get emotional with that uh, sort of thing, I, I probably wouldn't recommend this movie um, just because, yeah, it, it really does delve quite deep into it. Um, so I'll give you that heads up right now because uh, I wouldn't want anyone going to that, not going into this, sorry, not knowing that. Um, but yeah, so... Yeah, I mean, just I will get to my recommendation soon, uh, but it I went with my wife, and she is not really a wrestling fan at all. The only wrestlers she can name is pretty much John Cena and The Rock and Randy Orton, surprisingly, she can name. Uh, so if you're not a huge wrestling fan, I think you are still probably able to enjoy it, maybe just from the story being told and uh, the realness of it as well, uh, and the acting... You know, if you're if you're into film, I guess uh, this will definitely itch that scratch for you. Uh, if yeah, if you're really turned off by wrestling or you despise wrestling, then this probably isn't the movie for you. But if you're slightly intrigued by it and you kind of like to know the ins and outs of behind the scenes, but this is a good one for you to watch. And if you enjoyed the wrestler with Mickey Rourke uh, from 2008, I think you will really enjoy this as well because uh, it doesn't focus heaps on the wrestling itself. It focuses on the people around wrestling and, you know, in and amongst it. But, yeah, I... Uh, running out of good things to say, uh, I'll touch on a few of the negatives. There's not a lot, but I'll touch on the negatives uh, in the spoiler territory. Um, but, yeah, this... My wife did say she did get a bit bored um, in the middle there. Uh, and she didn't know anything about the Von Erichs at all, and she did find it very tragic and quite sad, and uh, it almost broke her in terms of crying like a few times and stuff. So, uh, yeah, I think if you want to drag your partner to it, I think there is a chance they might enjoy it if if they like Zac Efron or they just like you know great stories and like really good dramas, this will probably um, satisfy them enough where they're not going to ask to leave or walk out on you. Uh, but if... If you know someone that really likes racing, I recommend go with them because I think you'll both enjoy it um, more uh, as a collective if you're both of you like wrestling. Uh, so let's go to the to the recommendation section. Uh, so here on Goose Talks Film, we like to uh, recommend movies in three different categories. So it's go see this in a cinema, wait until streaming, or don't bother watching this at all. Uh, I personally would put this in, go watch this in the cinema. It's not to say that this is one of those movies where you're only going to enjoy it if you go see the movies, but I think it's important to support movies like this because it's made by A24. Uh, they're obviously a lower level uh, movie company. They also um, didn't have to uh, engage in the actors and writers strikes because they were already happy to pay um, whatever the actors and writers were demanding. So they were actually uh, able to continue with their work and whatnot and uh, release their movies and promote them, blah, blah, blah. So I think it's really important to support any A24 film. I think they make great films. I think they're very supportive of their filmmakers as well. They give them a lot of uh, uh, free will to, to do their own vision. Uh, so, yeah, I would recommend this to go see the cinema. Uh if you're not, like I said, a massive wrestling fan, that I would say definitely watch this on streaming then. Definitely watch this in general. So you kind of have two options here. I think uh, if you're strapped for cash in today's climate, that's completely fair enough because the cost of living is crazy right now. So if you want to wait the six to eight to ten months for this to be on streaming, then do that. Or even you're willing to pay 
uh, five to ten dollars for it to be cheaper to release once it's off the new release list. Uh, when it hits digital, probably in a few months' time, I think. Uh, but yeah, no, definitely recommend it. Uh, either way, if you're a movie freak and you go to the cinema a lot, and you're umming and ahhing if you want to go see this or The Boys in the Boat, or they haven't seen The Boys in the Boat yet, but I'll be reviewing that next week. That is a 1930s sporting film about rowing. Uh, I'd recommend you go see this. Uh, but yeah, I can't talk about the other film, obviously, because I haven't seen it, so I can't really say this one's better. But yeah, if you have a membership where you go to the movies a lot, then I'd say you're not going to waste your money. I think this movie has something for everyone. It's not just for wrestling fans. But yeah, that's the recommendation. So I'll give you my spoiler warning right now. If you don't want this movie spoiled, then pause right here, go watch the movie, come back, and we'll delve back into this together. All right, so we are in the spoiler territory where I'll delve into the movie a bit more. Uh, yeah, so this is obviously a very tragic uh, and yeah, definitely upsetting film for sure. Uh, like I stated earlier, if you're a bit bothered or triggered by uh, suicide or mental health in general, then I wouldn't recommend this movie because uh, it would probably hit home for a lot of people. Uh, yeah, it, it it is tragic and it is depressing, but it, it's also a little bit uplifting in a weird way of the way that Kevin was able to just push past it and lose all of his brothers and still be able to live a happy life, have heaps of kids, heaps of grandchildren, be able to live um, as happy as he can be and, and get through it all. And Zac Efron does an amazing uh, job at portraying that as well. Uh, so, yeah, I uh, won't read the full uh, spoiler-ridden uh, plot for this because it is very, very extensive wherever I've looked. Uh, but it's pretty much the... If you haven't watched this movie and you're still listening, it's pretty much uh, Fritz the Father was a big wrestler back, I think it was in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And he was touted to be kind of the next big heel uh, in wrestling. If you don't know what a heel is, it's the vil villain and a face is like the hero, pretty much. I'll be using those terms throughout, so I thought I'd better explain it. And he was never the NWA champion. NWA uh, was the governing body, pretty much, for all the wrestling territories in America. That's what they were called were wrestling territories. So each uh, area pretty much had their own wrestling territory. And they'd still go on tours and stuff, but their territory, their home base would be the biggest crowds and their fans and whatnot. And the Von Erics was, they were huge in Texas. So Fritz would obviously grow up uh, to run his own wrestling company, uh, WCCW, uh, World Class Championship Wrestling, not to be confused with WCW. Although I think WCW would technically own it to a point, and then obviously WWE would buy WCW. Uh, so all of his sons would pretty much uh, grow up to be wrestlers. As I started earlier, Kerry was going to be Olymp Olympian for discus, but unfortunately that dream got ripped from him. So Fritz gave him the opportunity to be a wrestler as well. Uh, there was an earlier son. He's actually was the eldest Jack Jr. He died when he was five. Uh, a lot of people referred to Kevin as the eldest brother, but he never liked to refer to himself as the eldest brother because uh, he, I think, felt as though people kind of forgetting his actual older brother, even though he had passed when he was five. Uh, so, yeah, the the casting in this is great. The The pacing could have done with a bit of work. Uh, you kind of get a bit, you know, adrenaline pumping with the wrestling and whatnot and... Um, all that, then it kind of comes to a halt, and there's a lot of dialogue scenes, and which this movie needs. I think, yeah, could have done with a bit of better pacing. Um, there, are, like the acting in this is just insanely good. I, I mean, it is insanely good. The overall casting was phenomenal. I was, I spoken earlier about Jeremy Allen White not being as imposing and as big as Kerry in person, but to put all that all aside, he, his acting is just great in this. He really, uh, it does a good job portraying him as someone that's loved by the fans and he's put on a pedestal because he's so athletic, he's good looking, he's so jacked up, he's huge. But he was battling demons for a long time, like a lot of the Von Eric boys, unfortunately, were. Uh, it does a great job of that. I've stated earlier, Harris Dickinson was really good for what we saw uh, as him for David, which unfortunately wasn't a lot because uh, excluding Jack Jr., he was the first uh, brother to pass. Uh, and the only one to 
not die from uh, suicide. And speaking of that, a lot of people may not know, uh, there actually was another brother. His name was Chris. Uh, he was completely left out of the film, uh, which was a, a tad odd. Uh, but, yeah, he actually died from suicide as well, which is just crazy. So there was actually the five of them, not just the four of them. So three out of the five died from suicide, which is just uh, it's just tragic. Like, it really pulls your heartstrings throughout the movie. It's, yeah, it's just... So damn tragic for the way David to go. He was the first one, which kind of triggered a lot of things. A lot of boys really struggled to get past it. Like, and obviously, um, fair enough too, because they were all very, very close. Uh, Fritz was very, uh, very, uh, I can't even speak. It was portrayed very well in the movie, how Fritz was. He clearly loved his sons, but also was very hard on them and wanted them to succeed in the highest form and he also uh, vicariously lived through them because he never got to hold the NWA world's title which was, at that point in time was the title you wanted to hold he never got to hold it he kept saying this is what we want this will be our title they keep robbing us blah 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 and that really portrays him as how he was I think I mean I didn't know him as a person I you know didn't watch WCCW in the 80s or anything like that. But from what I gather, all the reading and all the documentaries and stuff I've watched, he was very much like that. He was very hard on his sons, but also he did show them love as well. Like he wasn't uh, physically abusive. I don't think he was hard on them in the ring to condition them or whatnot. Um, and their mother was very well uh, portrayed by Maura Tierney as well, was very, your boys, you deal with it amongst yourselves. I love you boys, but boys' business is boys' business, and they do a good job of portraying that in the movie as well. Uh, I would just say Holt McElhaney's Fritz Von Eric the Father was just amazing. Like, I can't state how great he is in this. Like, he really, even in terms of a little bit of looks-wise, but if you compare from what I saw of Fritz in interviews and everything you read about him, like Holt McElhaney couldn't have portrayed him any better. And a few people in the wrestling world have stated that Holt played him a bit more villainous and a bit more grotesque, which I, I disagree with the grotesque part. I, I thought he portrayed a father that was very hard on his sons, lived through them. Uh, he shown them love, but also could be quite hard on them. And that's what Fritz was like from all accounts. Maybe we obviously don't get to see a lot because it's only, you know, a two-hour-plus movie. We don't see the ins and outs. We don't see the really bad. We don't see the really good. But I think they shown enough of him also trying to be a good dad as well. In parts, he was also really bad. But, yeah, I think Holt was just great. And I, I am just sick of the major award shows just looking past A24 in general. They they just look past A24 just all the time. Uh, award shows are pretty much about money. They always pretty much have been, 90, 90%. And this movie was eligible for the Oscars. I checked it was eligible. Uh, if they actually campaigned for this, maybe that's why it didn't get a bit more traction in terms of nominations and stuff. But everyone's talking about Jer Jeremy Allen White for supporting actors should have been nominated. I agree, but more so Hot Michelini as Fritz. Just for him to not be recognised is just really annoying, especially for a character actor like Hot Michelini. He's never really been a leading man, but a lot of people might know him from the Netflix TV show Mindhunter. He is great in that as well. Uh, but in this, he's probably the best performance I've ever seen him in, and I have seen him in a lot of stuff because he's, yeah, been a character actor for 20, 30 plus years. He's been in a lot of stuff. I remember seeing him stuff as early as early 90s, late 80s. So he's great. Like I said, Maura Tierney is phenomenal. Zach Efron, really, really good. The way that Efron can just portray very likable and genuine uh, characters is really, really good. I think he's underrated. I was saying to my wife after we watched it, a lot of people that still hate on Zac Efron and still say he's not very versatile. I'll give them three movies to watch. That is this, The Iron Claw, High School Musical, and I can't remember the name of it, but the Ted Bundy movie. Three very, very different portrayals, and he does a great job at portraying all of them. And two of them are real-life people, which is the hardest 
for actors to portray. They've said it before because you're trying to be someone else. You're not creating your own character to portray. So, and Efron has stated that the most important review was from Kevin himself, and Kevin really campaigned hard for this movie. He ticked off on Efron's performance. He ticked off on the movie in general. He really lauded Guerrero's uh, ability to direct the wrestling matches and uh, coordinate them really well. So Kevin was a fan of this. So I think that Efron's right. That is the most important review you can get. Uh, so Efron's really, really good in this. Like I said, if you're a big Efron fan, well, this is a movie for you because you know he's the main character. It focuses on Kevin a lot. Because uh, he's obviously the only one that survives, but also a lot of things uh, involve him. Because, I mean, he was the one that they all rang when they were distressed and when they were suicidal and all that. So, yeah, I think this is a movie for you if you're an Efron fan, if you're a Jeremy Allen White fan uh, from The Bear and uh, other things as well, watch this. If you're a Harris Dickinson fan, watch this. Harris Dickinson was also in a show I watched, uh, Murder at the End of the World, with Clive Owen. And himself, highly recommend that. He's great in that. I think he's got a big, big future uh, for just from watching him the last couple of years. I think he's been in some great, great stuff. And uh, Holt McElhaney, it's a shame that he's not getting the awards, love, but a lot of actors don't care about that stuff. I don't know if he does, but I hope he knows that he was the best part of this movie. And that's, and that's not a bad thing. You know, you can say things about, oh, yeah, you know, he was the best thing about that because the movie was shit. Well, not in this case. This is a really good movie. And he is just, like, I keep talking about he's just phenomenal in this. Like, he really, really is phenomenal. And then you have, uh, trying to think of her name now, you have Lily James as uh, Pam, which uh, is Kevin's wife. They end up being married for 40 plus years. They are still together right now, which is great. Uh, He found someone that he could be with and go through all this turmoil with, and she stuck by him, and that's also great. Love story they tell. It's not forefront. It's kind of like a supporting uh, plot line here. But I think, yeah, they tackle that really, really well. Um, and it's really good to see them feature other wrestlers from that era as well. We know Bruiser Brody, who unfortunately was murdered. Uh, they say it was self-defense, but by all accounts, it wasn't. Uh, so he was stabbed, I think, in the mid to late 80s. Then you have uh, Aaron Dean Eisenberg as Ric Flair, which is probably not one of the best performers of the movie. Uh, if you were to tell me that that was uh, anyone but Ric Flair, or like you know, I would have believed you. In terms of like, he looked like Ric Flair, but in terms of how he spoke and how he delivered his lines, and I didn't believe it, unfortunately. But then we had Chavo Guerrero actually make a cameo as the Sheik, uh, which I'm not sure if they actually even announced that in the movie that he was actually the Sheik or not. Maybe they did. Maybe it was just a background announcing thing. We didn't quite quite hear. Uh, and the budget was only $15.9 million, which is crazy. I mean, A24, that's what they do. They make phenomenal movies on tight budgets. And you might think, oh, $15 million, like almost $16 million, like that's a lot. I mean, in terms of making movies, especially in 2024 slash 2023, it's really not that big of a budget, especially when you're making a movie that's set back in time. Even if it's 30, 40 years ago in the 80s and 90s, it still costs money to make everyone look like it's the 80s, to make things look like the 80s in terms of set decoration. And it's currently the box office made thirty six million, so it, it, it has made a profit, which is really good. Uh, I really hoped it would make more than thirty six million. Maybe by the end of its run, it might be pushing closer to thirty eight, thirty thirty eight, thirty nine million. Sorry, at the box office, we we'll wait and see. Because uh, I mean, we we want more wrestling stories. We we really do. Speaking of Gueros, I'd love a movie about Eddie Guerrero. That's been spoken about now. That that's a movie that a lot of people want. Uh, you could do a lot. You really could, and uh, I hope this has paved the way for a lot of movies like this, where it really shows the dark side of the ring, like to quote the name of the TV show that tackles all the ins and outs of the dark side of wrestling. Uh, I think if you were to make movies about that, you could do one about Bruiser Brody that's featured in this, and then have Zac Efron or whoever, as of on next, make a cameo on that. That'd be a nice little connecting, I want to say, a universe thing, because I think that'd be a silly term to use in this, but you know what I mean? Like, to connect them all, there were real people that did cross paths with each other quite a lot, especially back in the Territory days when there was a lot of different wrestling companies that would borrow each other's wrestlers and whatnot. Um, 
Yeah, I still think it's crazy that they left out Chris Von Eric, a whole person. They just completely cut out of the film. I know they would have added time to the movie. Uh, but it just, yeah, it's kind of weird, isn't it? It's kind of like movies where they completely add a new character that wasn't there in real life. It's kind of the same thing where you completely cut it. And an important part as well. I mean, he was the youngest brother. Uh, he did wrestle. Uh, he ended up being very similar to Mike. I think they might have just seen the similarity between both Mike and Chris's story and kind of just left with Mike's story. Because Chris broke his arm. He couldn't wrestle anymore. He wasn't as big as the other boys. He couldn't get as big and physical as them. He was shorter. And yeah, he unfortunately committed suicide. And again, talking to Kevin, saying that he was suicidal. And then afterwards, when Kevin talked to him, promising that he wasn't going to do anything silly, anything like that, Kevin left him. And then unfortunately, the next morning or the next night, he, he committed suicide. So um, very tragic. Uh, there were some great scenes in this. I, I really did like the scene where Pam actually... Goes, gets an autograph from Kevin and pretty much asks him out on a date and it shows that Kevin was quite sheltered in the romance side. Like they weren't really party boys. They weren't going out drinking and sleeping with everyone. Like they were really, you know, determined to be wrestlers. They were hard at work in terms of wrestling and also on the farm because the Eric's lived on an, a ranch that Fritz ran and made, you know, put them to work and he worked as well. So I, th- I thought that was really good, them showing that Kevin was a virgin before he got with Pam and uh, she still loved him for it. She thought it was cute and that kind of added to her love for him. And yeah, I think it's really, really good. They, they focus on the love story between those two. Um, and I, I could be wrong. Don't, don't quote me. I haven't done research, but I'm pretty sure Kerry actually had a daughter that they left out of the movie completely as well. Maybe they didn't, they didn't seem it, uh, deem it necessary to be in the movie. But like I said, a lot of, Real life movies can't involve everything. They really can't because they're limited to, t- to two hours, two and a half hours, majority of the time. Sometimes three for Oppenheimer, but not everyone gets, you know, Chris Nolan minutes, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I think that they did a really good overall job with just telling the story that they could, including everything that they could, obviously focusing on the brothers that they had, uh, the four of them. And also Jack Jr. as well. And that was a scene at the end that caught my wife and I a bit off guard. It was um, a very emotional scene. So when Kevin finds Kerry had, had shot himself at the tree and he tries to see if he's okay, realizes that he's dead. And then Fritz comes over and he tackles Fritz and blames him for the murder of not looking after him. And then he is crying. He's carrying Kerry in the house and puts him on the dining room table and he's crying. And as that intertwining scene is happening, Kerry's uh, on a boat on the water and uh, he's heading to a jetty and he sees his two brothers. He sees Mike and David. They greet him. Uh, you realize that it's the afterlife because Kerry says, oh, you're finally the world champion. It took you to get into the afterlife to get it. And he's referring to David. Uh, he's wearing a belt. And then they hug and they they reveal that Jack Jr. is there, that, that Jack Jr., he, he gets to meet his brother and they all hug as a group and he ends there. That That is just a really gut-punching scene just for just a multitude of things for in terms of suicide from two of them dying from suicide, one from just a tragic medical episode that could have been avoided if he'd gone to the doctors. They would have told him not to fly to Japan and he wouldn't have died. But then seeing Jack Jr. there and then, yeah, that hits home if, if you're a parent as well. If you're a parent of a, of a boy, of a girl, of uh, even kids that have grown up. Oh, you know, I've got a young daughter now. And just seeing that, it, like, it really did hit home. And it really does punch in the gut more often. Like, that was the scene that kind of got us the most, uh, that got us very emotional. Um, it was a touching moment that they finally all got to be together once again. Unfortunately, not with Kevin. Kevin's kind of left behind. They kind of emphasize that with Kevin. Then cutting back to him at the dining room table, crying, uh, looking at Kerry's body. So that whole scene was done really, really well. They obviously really wanted to just leave us with one more traumatic, dramatic scene, but also try and give us a bit of closure a bit with all the brothers and whatnot. It was just touching, upsetting, gut punching. It was just everything. So many emotions just going through. It was just, yeah, 
very good direction by uh, Sean Durkin. I haven't actually touched on Sean Durkin yet. He actually directed and wrote this. Uh, he pulled double duties by himself, and that's what I mean about A24. They really give their filmmakers the ball and then let them shoot with it. So um, he also produced it as well. So he really had a hand in everything he wanted to do. He kind of did, from what I can gather. Uh, he did do uh, movies in the past. He has done Martha, Marcy, May, Marlene. God, that's a mouthful. <laughs> He directed that back in 2011. I do remember that movie gaining a bit of uh, awards buzz early on, and then it kind of unfortunately died out. Uh, and he did a bit of TV directing with uh, Dead Ringers, which was released last year with Rachel Weiss. He directed three of those episodes, and I think he produced it as well. So he had a big hand in that show. Uh, and The Eye of Claw is clearly uh, his best work from what I've seen of his. I've seen a few of his, his stuff, and this is definitely his best entry in his filmography, filmography Sorry, so far. And the world is his oyster. He's shown that he can direct, write, and produce. So I think A24 really need to like lock this bloke down because he could be one that they could really rely on to release these types of movies and not rely on horror all the time like A24 has or even thrillers. This is definitely a drama, an intense drama, uh, but it has no really uh, you know, sprinkles of horror or thriller. It's completely drama. And I'd even, I know it's wrestling, but I would really call this a sport movie because it really focuses on the people and the fallout of wrestling, not so much wrestling itself. But obviously it's all entwined in that. It's probably, I, I would probably prefer this over The Wrestler, if I'm on, if I'm being honest, just because I felt as though uh, it, it was slow, but it was faster than The Wrestler, I think was telling you a bit of a better, better story, uh, being based... On real life, and I know the wrestler probably took th- like real things from different stories, kind of combined them into one thing. But this is solely about the Von Erichs. All the major stuff actually happened. There are a few inaccuracies in this movie, mainly the chronological order of things, and obviously completely leaving out one of the sons, Chris. Uh, I think that's a big blunder in myself, uh, in my opinion. But did great nonetheless. Sean Durk he did a really, really good job. Um. Yeah, I think we're running out of things to talk about because I think I've been majorly positive. And is this going to be the best movie I've watched this year? I doubt it. Um, But do I see this being in my top 10 at the end of the year when I review all my reviews on the podcast? I I do maybe see this potentially being in the top 10. We'll we'll see how the movie pans out. Um, I covered Argo last week. Obviously, completely different movies are not fair to compare, but... In terms of on my podcast and if you ratings, this is obviously going to fare better than Argyle. Um, like I said, completely different movies. It, it, it's shit to compare, but you know, kind of have to, don't I? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I haven't talked much about the cinematography. Cinematography is great. I'll touch on that at the end of show ratings, but um, the wrestling, you, you got to see a majority of, of the things going on. Um, sometimes... The camera angles were a bit hard to see and a bit fast paced to see exactly what was going on. But then again, you know, they weren't important things we had to see in the ring. The important stuff we did see. So that's fine. Uh, the lighting and stuff was really good. They did a good job of uh, really capturing what it's like to be at a wrestling show. So it is really dark and gloomy because all the lights are off and they have sometimes uh, really shitty lights depending on the production of the show, like how, how big of a show you're going to. But I've been to quite a few wrestling shows in my time and it really did capture what it's like being at a wrestling show. And I can imagine what it was like being at an 80s wrestling show. Uh, so I think they did a really good job of cat- capturing that. Sorry. They did a good job of trying to make everyone look like their real life counterparts as much as they could, given uh, giving Zac Efron Kevin's haircut and all that. Although he doesn't really look a lot like Kevin. Kevin's got a longer face, a bit more gaunt, whereas Zac's obviously got a wider uh, more filled out face, but like I said, in terms of the body transformation, his body to look like Kevin's was just crazy. Like you put side to side pictures up, the bodies are almost identical. And yeah, they made everyone look like their counterparts. Like I said, really, really good. Everyone acted like their real life counterparts, maybe except for the guy playing Ric Flair, unfortunately. But he he, he was still playing a character that uh Ric Flair played, but in terms of trying to be Ric Flair, in terms of sounding like him, talking like him, looking like him, not great. But 
I can forget that because he's literally in maybe a two-minute scene, so it's all good. Uh, the guy playing Harley Race, incredible job. Uh, I almost thought that they just AI'd Harley Race in this because it really looked like him. He did a good job acting like him. And I said to a wife, like, that's back then, you didn't have to be a Hulk Hogan and stuff. You didn't have to be six foot five and built like a brick shit house to be a top wrestler. Bob Backlund, Iron Sheik, all these guys, they weren't. They had dad bods, pretty much. I think that's great, and they did a good job of showing the difference between Harley Race, who was a champion, and Kevin at the time, and and Harley just having his way with Kevin uh, in that match, and that very important match that tells the story of Kevin not being able to be good on promos. So all the brothers were good at certain things, and they always say Kevin was the best all-rounder in terms of the wrestling. Like, he could do everything in the ring and look great. His drop kicks were phenomenal. David was really good on the mic, and he was taller. Had a really good frame that was different for the time. He kind of was really taller than a lot of other wrestlers, so he looked really more imposing. Kerry was probably the biggest in terms of physical. He just had that physical presence. And he was also really good in the ring and also pretty decent on the mic as well. Uh, and unfortunately, Mikey wasn't really good uh, at anything like, in terms of wrestling, and it's a shame that he never got to pursue his, his music career like he wanted to, which is a very sad part of his story as well. Then you have Chris, who wasn't included in the movie, but he was decent in the ring. He was just too small in terms of stature, and he couldn't put weight on. A bit like Mike, but Mike had a bit more height. Uh, so, yeah, in terms of capturing everything real life, great. Holt McElhaney looked uh, as convincing as he could be to look like Fritz, and Moritione did look like the mum quite well. And, yeah, everyone just did their part really, really well. Everyone was able to be showcased, even with a little screen. So, Jeremy Allen White as Kerry comes into it a bit later because obviously when we first touch on Kevin and David, he's off training for the Olympics. So we don't see him until well after half an hour into the movie and then obviously he dies towards the end of the movie. So we do see him for a chunk of it. But yeah, they do a good job of still being able to showcase everyone's story and tell all the tragedy of everyone and all that uh, in the time they're given. And that's really good. Uh, display from the director, really. It goes down to the director and the writing, being able to do that. Uh, yeah, so I think I'm going to land the plane here in, in terms of talking about the movie. And uh, I don't like to, to go scene by scene by scene. That's not how I kind of review movies. I kind of just talk about what I do like, what I don't like. Maybe there's a scene or two that I really liked or disliked, and I jump around here and there. So I'm not really... <laughs> Chronologically, my reviews aren't great, but if you like this soul, thanks for listening. If you don't, I don't blame you for not listening. <laughs> but it's probably when I do episodes with co-hosts, it might be a bit more uh, coherent, a bit more in term, like better in terms of chron- chronological order as well. Uh, so we'll end the plane in terms of reviewing this movie. Uh, now on uh, Goose Talks Film, we do like to uh, rate our movies, and that's in four categories. Each category is rated out of five. And then that totals the uh, rating at the end of the movie out of 20. Uh, so our goal last week got 12 out of 20. And uh, so we review each category on directing, writing, acting, and cinematography. So we start with the directing. Sean Durkin, you know, like I started, I think he's got a really good career ahead of him. He directed Marcy May and Marlene well over 10 years ago. That was about 2011 that was released. So... He stayed out of the limelight with feature films. I think he released a movie in 2020 that not a lot of people saw or it wasn't really covered a lot. I think he's definitely going to get more in the limelight because of The Iron Claw, which is great. Uh, yeah, in terms of directing this movie, I think, like I said, everyone was showcased well with the time they were given. Uh, it's a lot to cover in two hours and 10 minutes. It really is. And I, in terms of director's cut, I don't think we need it because director's cuts usually what add, you know, 10, 15 minutes to sometimes 45 minutes. I don't think that would just be any point and not enough time to even add Chris. So, yeah, I think directing is just really good in this movie. It's not, you know, do I think this would have won Best Director at the Oscars if the Oscars weren't a bit biased? No, I don't think so. But it it looks great. They captured scenes really well. Like the scene where... Kevin lost his shit in the ring and won by disqualification, uh, lost by disqualification when he wasn't meant to, when he wouldn't let go of the iron claw on Ric Flair. Ric Flair started bleeding and stuff. That scene was really well done where Kevin's trying to calm himself down and Rick comes in and 
doesn't give the reaction they thought. Like he says, "I'll give you a, I'll give you a rematch whenever you want." Like you crazy son of a bitch. Like that's you're different. I like that. You're not soft like I thought you was. But that doesn't matter to Fritz because Fritz is pissed off because he didn't do what Fritz wanted him to do. So Fritz won't let him get a rematch, which is yeah, very very good. And also the table, the dinner scenes and the breakfast scenes where Fritz literally says, "Oh." He's my favorite. He's my second favorite. Third, fourth. Rankings can change. You can go up. You can go down. Just that comes down to Sean's writing as well. And I'll probably tackle both of these together because he does both. And I do them back to back anyway. So the directing and writing from Sean is really, really good. We get a lot of questions answered in quick dialogue. So you're not having to listen to a 20 minute scene to get a few answers. Uh, there are, you know, there's five minute dialogue scenes where there's two people talking you get all these answers get a lot of information not, but it's not too much information uh sometimes i think the the editing also probably comes down to the writing as well is telling a coherent, coherent story sorry where sometimes they would tell you the date and the year and the play and the setting of a scene and other times they wouldn't but they've time jumped a little bit um which got a bit confusing. So they would be like, oh, this wrestling match was that, you know, they're doing like the whole TV wrestling thing where it's the so and so match in the year of 1986 for the World Championship match between blah, blah, blah. Then another scene, it would be like, okay, Pam's pregnant. And then it jumps to her being even further pregnant. And then it jumps to her kids being already a few years old. And sometimes it's easy to explain through dialogue or few uh, a few different ways but sometimes throughout the movie it wasn't always the best in terms of telling us when which like this scene is taking place which can get a bit annoying but it wasn't it wasn't too confusing you kind of picked it up after a while when you're like oh, okay and it didn't really matter a lot of the time uh, in terms of telling the story but for the directing i would give this a 3.5 out of 5 i think sean did an incredible job at directing this uh, and also bringing Chavo on board to to pretty much direct the wrestling scenes. I think that goes under the directing as well. And for the writing, I'll go with three. I'm probably the most harsh on the writing category out of the four. Uh, just that's just how I am, I guess, because I've always wanted to be a writer. I've done a bit of writing, nothing of note, so I can't really say, oh, yeah, this is bad, good writing. <laughs> Don't listen to me. But everyone's got an opinion, and my opinion on writing is always a, a bit harsher. I think it's one of the most important parts uh, because they say a movie's only as good of a script. You know, you can get the best directors ever, a Tarantino, a Spielberg, a Scorsese, but it, if it's a pile of shit, then I can only do the best I can. But this, yeah, I'll give the writing a three out of five. Uh, yeah, just mainly for chronolo- chronologically changing a few of the live events that I, I think didn't have to be changed and also leaving out Chris uh, and not telling the full Von Eric story. Uh, wasn't great, but three still a good good writing for writing. Now going on to the acting, I've already spoken about probably for the majority of the podcast about how good the acting is in this movie. Uh, Holt McElhaney, Jeremy Allen White, and Efron are probably the three standouts. But like I said, everyone does a really good job in this. Uh, yeah, I mean even like I said earlier, the the actor playing Rick Flair still did a good job of acting, like you. My wife didn't know who Ric Flair was, so she thought that he did a good job portraying a villain that was a bit of an arsehole that was actually surprisingly a bit nice to Kevin in the change room. So, yeah, I think the acting, I I have to give this a 4.5 out of 5. That's a high, high rating. I don't know if I'll be giving many movies this year an acting rating that high, but I can't give this anything lower than a 4.5. You know... The only thing stopping this from getting a five out of five is probably there was no performances like where I thought, oh shit, they need to win the Oscar, like, they need to win the Oscar, blah blah blah. Holt McLean, like I said, was amazing, like phenomenal. But would I have backed him to win the supporting actor even if he was nominated and the Oscars weren't biased and shit? Still probably not. He should have been nominated, though, I will say. He hundred percent should have been nominated. So that's what stops this from getting a 5 out of 5, but 4.5 for acting, trust me, is a really good score. Cinematography, um, didn't touch on this heaps like I usually would, like I did with Argyle um, last episode. But the cinematography was great. They did a really good job. Whenever they were on the ranch outside, it was always a bright, sunny day. 
It, you could tell that it was hot. They did some really good long shots of Kevin jogging and showing he, showing how intense he was as a trainer, how hard he worked. And some of the really good close-up scenes in the emotional scenes were really good. There wasn't an oversaturation of the close-up scenes. There was some really good, yeah, like I said, long shots, medium shots, establishing shots were really good in this. The establishing shot is so important. If they're not telling you where they are, they need to show you where they are. And this movie did a really good job of showing, okay, they're on the ranch. They're inside the Von Eric house. They're inside Kevin's apartment. They're inside this course, wrestling coliseum. They're inside the locker room. Like They did a really good job. And they also, in all the wrestling scenes, like I said, they made it feel like you were at a wrestling show with the actors and whatnot. They did a really good job of that in terms of the lighting. So lighting and all that comes under cinematography, all that stuff. So I have to give the cinematography a four out of five, which is a very, very good rating for cinematography. Uh, cinematography is one of the most important parts of a film. So I think four point, uh, sorry, four out of five is really good. So that gives us a total of 15 out of 20. Uh, so like I said, at the end of the year, based on all the ratings out of 20, all the movies will be ranked for the top 10 of the year, for the, for the bottom 10 of the year. And that might not always reflect my personal opinion. Like if I was to name the top 10 movies that I've seen this year and covered on the podcast, might be slightly different than what I'll get from the ratings from the podcast. Just because my personal opinion might be changed from, I, I, I might change, oh, I might rewatch this movie more, so that might jump a spot. Whereas in terms of just analyzing a film, in terms of the filmmaking and whatnot, could be a bit different. Uh, but yeah, with, I wouldn't be surprised if the, if this is in the top 10 at the end of the year. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, so that brings us towards the end of the podcast. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, if you've listened this far, I'm I'm still learning and uh, doing different things on the podcast. It's only my second official episode, so I appreciate all and any of the support you give me. Make sure if you do like this podcast, you follow me on all my uh, socials on Instagram, Facebook, um, all under Goose Talks Film or YouTube as well, and wherever you listen to your podcast, I'm currently on uh, YouTube, Amazon Music, and Spotify. I am, and also Audible, which is also part uh, partnered with Amazon. I am trying to get uh, listed on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, all that. All those ones take a bit more time, so I appreciate all the support and any of the support. And make sure if you have any uh, recommendations of movies you want me to watch this year, I do have my time telling movies, but... If there's one you really want me to cover, please let me know. Send me a DM or comment on one of my posts on YouTube or Facebook or whatever. But uh, yeah, thanks so much for your support, guys. This has been Goose for Goose Talks Film. And make sure you keep watching those movies.